today we're going to be learning Yavama Daf Chet. Um, today's Daf is dedicated uh, for a Rafua Shlema uh, for uh, Dr. Yehoiakim Isaacs, Avram Chaim Ben Fruma, a seasoned Daf Yomi learner from the Isaac and Darsham families. And today's Daf is sponsored anonymously in loving memory of Moshe Ben David, Harav Moshe Feinstein. And today's staff is dedicated by Marsha Baum in honor of the birth of her granddaughter, Maria Nava, born to her children, Jessica and Jeremy Miles. How wonderful that this little girl has been born in an amazing age when Gemara learning for girls is acceptable and encouraged by many. Okay, we're going to start right now um, at the top of Daf Chet. So we have presentations for today. So if you're watching the Zoom, great, you'll be able to see them. If you're not, number one, I recommend you try to. And if not, you can find a link. You can find the presentations directly on the website. There's also a link to them, the PDF of them on the, on the podcast details. If you're using the podcast, you could just open it while you're doing it. Obviously, if you're doing some other activity like driving or you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that or uh, running or something like that, but you might want to look at it later to just review. It'll be helpful. And just a reminder, if you're watch, if you're using it in the PDF format and not the presentation format, which is directly from Canva, um, you'll have, if you view it, it, it in a regular, like on your browser, it won't come out with the right effects of it, things looking like they're moving. So you should open it in something like an Adobe Reader. Adobe Reader is free. You can download it free if you don't have it on your computer. Definitely recommend it. Okay. So now what we had, again, we're just going to review. We have to keep reviewing because we've been in this topic for many, many days. And it's always good to just kind of go back and review, which is we're trying to figure out. We started with this trasha aleha, which was talking about a man marrying two sisters. And it said aleha, which is basically, right? That was to tell you aleha connected to yibum. Even when there's yibum, you cannot marry a woman and her sister. And that's to teach you that yibum doesn't override achotisha. The question is, why would you have thought it did? It's a riot, right? It's pretty serious. It's karet. First, we thought maybe the misfarase overrides a lotase even when this karet. We couldn't prove that. So it seems like probably not. We'll see that today again. Then we suggested yesterday two other suggestions. Maybe we learn it out from the arayot of, of Eshet Ach, right? In general, Yibum is arayot because she's marrying her brother's, her bro the brother's marrying his brother's wife, which she's not allowed to do. So... The fact, so maybe we learned it. The first attempt was to say it's from Davar Shaya Bichlavi Yatsam Naklal. It was part of everything and then was taken out. Whenever you have an exception that was taken out, details, we learn from there to anything like that. But we said, no, 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 this isn't the same because one, where they were gro grouped together was, was where it's forbidden. And the one where it was separated out was what's permitted. So you can't learn from Isul to Hetel. It doesn't work that way. Then we suggested maybe a bamematsinu, which is another word for a paradigm. Well, since the Torah says in one place, maybe we should learn from there to all places. So since the Torah says yibum can happen, even if it's a riot, why don't we learn from there to everything else? To which we said, ah, uh, wait a minute. There's a difference. Eshet ach, your brother's wife, when you do yibum, that's one isur, one araya. But when you marry your brother's sister, your, your wife's sister, you're actually doing two arayo because every yibum is by definition your brother's wife. So number one, you have that erva, and now you're adding a second erva. Can't do that. It's two versus one, right? That, that's not com comparable. But then the Gemara said, what do you mean? Why don't we go by this principle? Just like the Mitzorah, and I'm not going to go back into all the details. Where I, well, I'll, I'll repeat them briefly. He's on Erev Pesach. It's his eighth day. He's supposed to go into the Azara, right, with his ear, his right ear, his right toe, and his right um, finger, he's allowed to put that in the azara, even though he's not really allowed to because he's a leper still. And then he becomes a balkari, he has a seminal emission, which also doesn't allow him to go into the temple. Well, since we allow it, because he's, even though he's a leper, we permit it, let's permit it also for the care. So now the Gemara is going to say, these situations are not comparable. Okay. And here comes our, our presentation. Okay. So now, we're now going to say that this is only in a particular situation. Okay, so let's start with our presentation. We have a case where Tinach, the Gemara says, I understand. Okay, and Ula, just so you get it straight, Ula was the one who said, Because we permit him to go into the Azara, 
even though he's a leper, because we permitted that, we're going to permit also the fact that he had a seminal emission and allow him to go into the azah. So now they say, well, Ula, your theory, Ula's theory works depending on the situation. There's two brothers. One is going to be called the dead one. One is going to be called the live one. It's kind of a little bit funny or weird that we're going to call Shimon, okay, in our sake, we're going to talk about Reuben and Shimon, two brothers. Shimon is the one who's going to die. And he's, his wife is going to fall to Ibum to Reuben. Now, he's going to be called dead because he's the one who's going to die. He's obviously not getting married when he's dead. It's obviously not really a possibility, just like you can't watch my my uh, presentations while you're driving, you can't actually get married while you're dead. But let's just assume, right, the, what the Gemara, not just assume, what the Gemara means is the one who's going to die gets married first. So Tinach, Ula would make sense in the case where Nassam made first Shimon married Levi. And this is why the presentations are important, shows the order of events, which means that right now, why is Leah forbidden to Reuben at that moment? Because she's married to his brother. So she's Reuben's brother's wife. Then, then Ruben marries her sister. At the, that point, Ruben becomes forbidden to her not only because he's the brother's wife, but she's also now, Leah is his wife's sister. So now she's forbidden for two reasons. Now remember, the brother's wife, Yibum overrides, but the wife's sister, it doesn't. And we're trying to figure out why. So if, now the whole question was here, to right, that since, since, Eshadach, the brother's wife, is permitted, we should permit the wife's sister as well. So Ula's claim in the comparison, and then we'd have a good explanation as to why Aleha is needed, is because you would have thought, in the case where first Leah was forbidden to Ruvain because she was the brother's wife, then when Ruvain married Rachel, she becomes the wife's sister. So you would have thought, that's the case, Demigo de Ishtarei, Sor Eshadach, since we permit, she's the brother's wife, we permit Yibum for that purpose, in other words, we're going to look at Leah as to what came first. What came first was the forbidden, the issue of brother's wife, and that gets overridden for Yibum. Since that gets overridden, we'll override the wife's sister as well. In a minute, we're going to change this a little bit, okay? But right now, the Gemara thinks that that would work with Ula. But Ella, in the case of Nasachai, Vacharkach Nasame, if Ruve married Rachel first. So now, what's Leah's relationship to Ruve? She's his wife's sister. So that's a problem, right? Because it's a problem and that's not going to be overridden for Yibum, right? And then Leah marries Shimon. And now she's not only the wife's sister, she's also the brother's wife. There the brother's wife comes second. So since the Isra of Achotisha comes first, Leah is going to be prohibited to marry Reuven. Okay, so that case, you can't say because the first Isra was not permitted. That's the wife's sister. That doesn't become permitted. Right? But now the Gemara says, but we're going to ask even further to Ula. We said it before that if Nasa met, if first Shema married Leah, and first Leah was forbidden to Reuben because she was the brother's wife, and then she became also his wife's sister, right? She was always the sister, but she, Rachel wasn't the wife yet. So we'd say, well, since the brother's wife gets overridden, we'll override the second thing as well. But the Gemara says that's not so true either, because there's, there's two options here as to when did Shimon die. Did Shimon die before Ruve Mary Rachel or did Shimon die after? So now they're going to say it's going to depend on the case what you would say. Tina, again, Ula will make sense that will say, since it's permitted, it's permitted, only in this case that what would happen? Nasamet, okay, first Shimon married Leah, then Vabet, and then Shimon died before Ruve Mary Rachel. Now, you might say, how is Reuben going to marry Rachel? Isn't he supposed to marry Leah? And then once he marries Leah, he can't marry Rachel? Well, let's see what happens. Next thing that happens is, okay, there's a few things you have to learn. Leah becomes, it's called Zikuka to Reuven. That means, okay, here we write this dotted, black dotted line. We're going to use it in a lot of different cases. It shows that when Shimon dies, Leah becomes connected to Reuven, okay, as if, they're married. They're not yet married. She's called the Shomerit Yabam, which means she's supposed to do Yibam with Reuven. Rachel's relationship to Reuven now, she's called Achot Zikukato, the Zikuka's sister. Now, that means, now, generally sisters can't marry the same person. Since Leah is supposed to marry Reuven, the rabbi said it's only rabbinic. It's not by Torah law because Zika is only rabbinic because until she actually marries him, she's not married by the Torah law. 
But since she's supposed to do Yibum with him, they were already somewhat connected, the rabbis claim. Rachel becomes the sister of, of you know, her sister is connected to Reuven. So now she's not really supposed to marry him, but only on a Durabanan level, meaning rabbinically prohibited, not by the Torah. So at this point, Leah can marry Reuven. Rachel's not supposed to, okay, because of her sister. But what if Rachel went ahead anyway and married Reuven? Okay, so it's a very unique case because it would have to be that Shimon died before Reuven, before, I'm sorry, before Reuven married Rachel, while Leah was supposed to do Yibum and didn't yet, Reuven decides to marry her sister, which is rabbinically forbidden, but it's not forbidden by Torah law. So let's just assume he did. Now, at that case, what happens? At this point, Leah becomes forbidden to Reuven because she was the wife's sister. Now, why is this case different? As the Gemara says, Dechazi Leh Bene Bene. At this point, Leah had a moment where she was actually permitted to marry Reuven because before Rachel married Reuven, she was supposed to do Yibam with him. So she had a moment where she was permitted. That's when we would say that we would override Achotisha. We would override the wife's sister because she was already permitted. Okay, so that's the case, basically. So because they're now saying, okay, so let's just go back. We said that Ula, who says, since we permit it, we permit it, would have to be where there was a moment in time where she was permitted. In the first case we saw, where we thought this case was okay, it was the first she was forbidden because she was the brother's wife. Then she became forbidden because her sister was married to him. But she never had a moment where she could actually marry Reuven because there hadn't been Yibum yet. By the time Yibum happened and Shimon died, Reuven was already married to her sister. So you can't say since it was permitted, it was permitted. It was never permitted. And now we're going to see this inside. First, in the first reading, we thought it has to do with the order that the prohibition became put upon you. Now we say, no, no, no. It has to be that there was a moment you were permitted, and we're going to see it from the leper case in a minute. So now the Gemara says, but the other case, Elanasam made Vilomate, if Shimon didn't die right away, but Harkach Nasachai and Ruve married the sister. She was never able to do Yibam with him. So there was no thing that permitted, that then permitted the other thing. So, and, and now we're going to see it in the leper case. Me lo mode Ula, does Ula not admit that what? If he had a seminal emission on the night of the eighth, our case was he's standing on Pesach morning, right? Era of Pesach morning. He's ready to go into the temple to do the, the sacrifice. Yeah, I'm sorry, to do his his purification for the Mitzvah thing where he puts his ear in and his nose and, and uh, sorry, his ear and his finger and his toe. And since we allow that, and then all of a sudden he has the seminal emission. So he had a moment where he was allowed to go into the Azran, therefore we permit it. But if the night of the eighth, he can't do his process yet because he has to wait for the morning because you don't do sacrifices in, at night. So if if he has a seminal emission on the night of the eighth and then comes to the temple in the morning, well, he can't because he never had a moment where he was permitted to go into the temple. The, the heter, the, the fact that we permit him to come to the temple is only on the eighth day in the morning. Since he was already had a seminal emission and was a Baal Keri, as they call him, where he can't go, even if he went to the mikvah, remember he has to wait till the sun sets. Therefore, it wouldn't work. And that would be comparable to our case. So at this point, we've only found one very unique case that would work to explain what Ula said, which is Ho'il the Ishtere Ishtere. And that's why, right, we tried to say, let's learn everything from the brother's wife. Then we said, right, that he can't marry his brother's wife. And yet we permit it for Yibu. Then we said, but it's one versus two. There's two Arayel going on if you're the, if it's also your sister's husband. So we end up saying, it doesn't matter that it's one against two. Because we have this concept, once we permit something, we can permit something else as well. So since we permit it, we per but that's going to only be in a very unique case where it was actually permitted first, where she was supposed to do Yibum, and then the brother married his sister, which again would be a very unique case because it's not even allowed to by rabbinic law. But the Gemara in any case says, okay, so you're looking for, right? So basically it seems like they're rejecting this answer, but they end up saying, well, you know what? May again, what are we trying to find? You have to keep remembering this. What is the reason why you need the Trasha Aleha to tell you she can't, he can't marry the, the sisters, the sisters, uh, the wife's sister, because you would have thought that maybe he could. Why would you have thought he could? Well, 
Maybe this is coming, that Trasha, for this one unique case. Okay, we're going to read that inside now. Ela ki itzri chaleha, that Trasha is for hecha denasa meit vameit vachar kach nasachat. That one unique case that I showed you in the picture with the Zika, where she could have married him, and then he marries her sister. In that one unique case, you would have thought it was permitted, since we permit Esherach, we permit Achot Isha, and that's why the Trasha is there. That's a very strange answer, but it's our actual first answer that isn't knocked down. Okay, we have a possible answer now. Every other answer we brought, the three that we brought until now, have been knocked down. This is really an outgrowth of three, but I call it four because now we actually have an answer. That really, you would have learned it from from Eshach, and you would have thought that since we permit that, we permit this as well, comes to say we can't. Ibait Emma, fifth answer, which also we're going to actually keep. You can learn it by a hekesh. What's a hekesh? A hekesh is often where you have two things in the same verse or in a verse right next to each other, and you say what's true for one is true for the other. In this case, a hekesh is being used as one pasuk that clumps a bunch of things together. So we'll learn that what's true for one is true for the other. These are all ways to basically learn it from, from eshet ach, because eshet ach is the one big heter, right? It says in the Torah, go marry your brother's wife, even though you're never allowed to marry your brother's wife. So we're going to learn it from there, but in a different method, not a klalu prat and not a bamematsinu, but from a hekish. They're all variations of the same idea. Dama Rabbi Yona, the Itema of Hunabrate Rabbi Yeshua, either Rabbi Yona said or of Hunabrate Rabbi Yeshua, Amarka, the Pesach says, Ki kol asher ya ase mi kol atoibota elevin chitu. We've seen this Pesach a few times. It's the end verse in chapter 18 of a Yikra with all the Arayo, and it basically clumps them all together. Anyone who does any of these despicable things will get karet. From here we learn they're all comparable to the brother's wife because everything's comparable to everything else. Right? You would have thought since we matir, we permit eshet ach for yibum, we would permit everything else as well. Therefore, katav rachmana aleha. That's why you need the trasha aleha to come and say, no, that's not the case. So now you have to make a jump though. You have to say, eshet ach would teach you for everything. Aleha teaches you for your sister, for your wife's sister, you can't do it for yibum. And from there, we learn to everything else because that's what we said. Remember, that was the whole beginning. All the, every, all the 15 cases in the Mishnah are all learned out from the Pasuk about the sisters, the wife's sister. So that's how you would say it. And we're going to see a big question about that in another minute. So now they say, Wait a minute. We now have logic to say that we compare everything to the brother's wife and then permit Ibum. On the other hand, we say, well, there's a special drasha by your wife's sister. From there, we're going to learn to everything. So it sounds a little arbitrary because theoretically, you could have learned all the Arayot from Eshadach and just your wife's sister is the one exception that you can't do that for Yibum. So they're kind of saying it's a little random that you chose, or arbitrary, that you chose that one instead of that one. So they say, Michti kol right? Since you could have compared them all to Eshadach, and you could have compared them to Achot my Chazid, what did you see? And as what made you, what made the, the drasha? Da'akish la'achot isha. Why did the Gemara say we're going to compare it all to Achot isha? Akshinu la'eshadach. What he's basically saying is, not that why did you do it this way or that way, but it's saying if your whole claim is, first everything's learned from Eshadach, then we have a unique drasha for Achot isha, and then we're going to learn everything from that one, well, it weakens this argument because theoretically it's very arbitrary. You could have learned everything from Eshadach and just she would be the one exception to the rule, the, the wife's sister. So the Gemara is going to give two answers for this question and then this answer will, not, will actually stand. And if you have a choice, we're going to compare it either to Eshadach and permit Yibum or we're going to compare it to Achot Isha and not permit Yibum. Well, better off not permitting, we'd rather be on the safe side and don't let someone sleep with a forbidden relative. So therefore, it makes sense to compare them all to Achotisha. Second option, Ibait Emo, alternatively, you could say, just like we said before, Achotisha has two problems. One is you're marrying your brother's wife. And number two, she happens to be your, your wife's sister. Okay, so... That makes sense. And then all the other Arayot have the same issue because all of them are Eshadach, plus they have something additional. Whereas Trey Mi Trey Alfina, you're going to learn two Isurim, a case of two Isurim from a case of two Isurim. But Ha Ha Chad Isura, 
But in Eshetach, there's only one thing you're doing wrong. And we're not going to learn from there to cases where there's more problems, right? More arayot, where it's double, because you have not just your brother's wife, but some other problem. Therefore, it makes sense that we're actually learning it all from Achotisha. So we now have two answers. Again, one is it's in that very unique case where there was a moment where she could have been Yibum. And therefore, since we permit that, and only later she becomes Achotisha, we'll permit that. But then the whole drasha is for a very unique case only. Or we're going to say, no, it's actually across the board, and you would learn it from a hekesh. Since you would learn it from a hekesh, we need the aleha to say, no, you can't do yibum with your wife's sister. Rava gives answer number six. And answer number six, I wrote on the, on the sheet, it's, I wrote it in Hebrew, nitrul hasheila, it neutralizes the question. It basically says, it's actually not a question. The question was, why do you need a drasha to teach you that the woman who's Right, the sister whose sister is married to the husband can't do yibum with that man because she's the sister, right? And then remember the drasha then continued and said, not only is she forbidden, but her tsara is, and then her tsara, tsara, and that was all from the words litzro, right? We learned about her tsara also can't, and the tsara tsara. So comes Rav and he says something very interesting, especially since we've been assuming all along that the drasha of Aleha is to come and say, let's say I'm the wife who my sister is married to my husband's brother. I fall to Yibam to my husband's brother and my sister's married to my can. That's what Aleha comes to say. Comes Rav and he says, you don't even need a verse for that. It's obvious that I can't marry my, my, wife, my sister's husband because she's my sister's husband. That's obvious. You don't even need a pasuk. The Aleha is actually not coming to teach that. So the Gemara is going to have a few questions with this, which are obvious. Like until now, we've been saying you do need it. So the Hatanya doesn't it say in a brayta only elahi? When we learned the whole drasha, we said aleha means the erva. Then it says, well, that only teaches us about the erva. How do we know about her tzacha? And then we quoted the next verse, litzro. So how can you say that the erva doesn't need a pasuk? It seems pretty clear there. So they say mishum tzarata. No, they were just building the case. They were trying to say, I can't, and my tzara can't. But they were only mentioning me so that they could get to the tzara, but they didn't really need to mention me because me really is obvious, okay? There's no need for a drasha, right? So you, you follow why this is huge because if he says there's no need for a drasha, it's obvious, then we don't have to go back to our big question, which is why did you think, why did you need a drasha to tell me I can't marry? Is, right, the whole question was, maybe I'll say, maybe that, but you don't even need it. It's obvious I can't. In other words, the whole, thing was to do gymnastics to try to figure out why we think I can. You don't need to do any gymnastics now because it was obvious that you that I can't. That was clear. And that's why we were struggling all along because we pretty much thought it was obvious. Comes right and he says it is obvious and that's not what the drasha is telling you. So of course, we're going to have to reread the drasha because it did seem that's what the drasha was saying. So now they have another question. Well, after it builds the tzara case, then it says, what about the tzara tzara case? And before it says that, it says, well, you got already from Aleha to the Ereva herself. Then you got from there to the Tzara. So Eli Aleha means, well, now you've proven me the Ar- Arayot, one, the woman who's really forbidden. You've proven to me the Tzara, which sounds like we needed Trasha for both. So again, they say, no, we shouldn't Tzara to hand. It was just to build the case to get to the next one. In other words, again, the Ereva is obvious. You didn't need a Trasha for it. They're just kind of mentioning it so we can get to the next stage because everything builds on her. So then they say a third problem, and later we're going to read this bright to much more in depth. Tashma, let's learn from this. Rebbe Yomit, v'lakach u'lekacha, v'yibem v'yibma. Okay, it's a bit of a weird pasuk because there is no such pasuk that says v'yabam v'yibma, v'lakach u'lekacha. What is this? This is the pasuk by, um, by Yibum. Okay, I'm going to read you the pasuk at chapter 25 of Sefer Tvarim, verse 5. When brothers are sitting together, you already learned that means, right, the brother has to be alive at the time. He doesn't have any sons. Right, the woman can't go marry anyone else. He's supposed to have relations with her to basically continue his, his brother's legacy. And he takes her. Likichazo is the word used for marriage. Well, that's as we get to Kiddushin. Okay, when he marries a woman. And he takes her. The hey at the end is specifically her. Leisha as a wife. And he does yibum with her specifically. 
So now what they say is, means it didn't use the word, it could have said, okay, the focus is on him. What does he have to do? He has to take her for his wife and do Yibam with her. It didn't need to say with her. That would have been obvious from the verse, okay? Because we were already talking about her. So the fact that it says, he takes her specifically, he does Yibam with her specifically. It's to limit the case. How to limit? Let's sort sarot varayot. It means he can only take her specifically and not if she's an erva and not if she's a tzara. This is basically the same drasha we learned from lotika, isha lachota lotika, flitzor, legalot ervata aleha, but he darshans it differently. We see there's two approaches to how to darshan it. One is the rabbis who darshan it from the other verse. One is this one, but both, but, right? Just like before, we seem to say the erva was part of the drasha. Also here, if, if it wasn't clear from there, maybe you could say the erva there was mentioned just to get to the tzara. Here, there's two things it's limiting. One is the erva, one is the tzara. That seems very clear that we need a drasha for the erva. And Rava said, you don't. It's obvious that she can't. So they say, No, don't read it. It doesn't mean second wives and the erva herself. No. It's lesor tzarot of the erva, meaning it's really only one thing, which we're going to have to say, what do you mean? There's two drashot, but okay. But right now they say the word tzarot varayot doesn't really mean tzarot and arayot. It means the tzarot of the erva. Okay, and that would resolve our issue. But ha tre kray kanasigle, but, but he had likacha yivama. Each one came for something different. So you can't say it was only for one thing. So they say, they actually say, no, my, right, and my love, chad erva, chad tzara, wouldn't it be what we thought? One was for the erva, one was for the tzara, and that knocks out rava. Lo, idi v'idi tzara. Really, they're both talking about the tzara, and you need both. Why? Chad l'meisar tzara b'makom mitzvah. One is to say the tzara in a makom mitzvah. What's a makom mitzvah? Yibum. When you're supposed to do yibum, you can't marry the tzara. That's what the first one is coming to teach you, right? Likacha, you have to take her. Only her if she's not the second wife of a forbidden relationship to you. And the other one's not there for you, Mubin all. It's coming to teach you that when it's not a Makom Mitzvah, when it's not Yibum, you're allowed to marry the Tzara. Yibama means you can't do Yibum with her, but if you were just marrying her, you could. Now, what on earth does that mean? That means if I'm married to another man, uh, to a man, sorry, and he has another wife, and he dies, let's say, with children. No yibum. Okay, there's no makom mitzvah. If the second wife, his second wife wants to marry my father, well, they're allowed because they have no connection to my father. It's only when there's yibum that I'm supposed to marry my father and I can't, then the tzara is permitted, uh, forbidden. But if we, if it's not a mitzvah, there's no yibum and she wants to marry someone who was related to me just because we married the same man at some point, and he's dead now, or he divorced both of us, she can marry whoever she wants. So that's what the second one is coming to teach you, that this forbidden thing, and we're going to deal with this a lot today, this forbidden thing about the tzara is only when there's yibum. Otherwise, she can marry any of my relatives if we're no longer connected through marriage to this, to this man, okay? And it's not yibum, okay? So that's what the second one is coming to teach you. So now they say, my time, well, how do we get this from the verse? V'yibem v'yibma, really comes to teach you bimkom yibum huda siret tzara, that only in yibum the tzara can't come. Shalom bimkom yibum shar yitzara. That's what I already explained before, right? If it's not yibum, then no. I'm Ravashi, manita nami daika. Ravashi comes and says now, the Mishnah is very clear that this is correct, what Rava said. Rava said, you don't need a special drush out for the arayo. How do you see this in our Mishnah? Because what did our Mishnah say? The Kazani. It's chamesh esrei nashim potrot tzarotehen. 15 women exempt their tzarot. Now, what doesn't it say? It doesn't say they're exempt and they exempt their, their second wives. No, it just says they exempt their second wives, which means that you don't need to tell us they, they're exempt themselves. That's obvious. So there we learn it, Shmami. Now we can learn it from the language of the mission. So now they say, okay, wait a minute. My shna erva. If you're going to say the erva, now we're going to say, okay, let's go back to our original piece. Right? Don't marry a woman and, and her wife, uh, a woman and her sister. And then in that same pasuk, it mentioned the tzara. So now we're going to assume whatever's true for the erva is true for the tzara. So if that's the case, they're going to ask Rava again. 
wait a minute. If the erva doesn't need a pasuk because it's so obvious, and why is it so obvious? Again, this is going to be the antithesis of what we were trying to prove earlier. Because if there's kare, you can't have an, a positive commandment override. So we don't override it for the purposes of evil. So also the tzara is forbidden in that verse. So therefore, Basically, we should say that Sarah should be the same as the Erva. It shouldn't even need a verse at all. To which I'm going to Rav Achabar Bevimal Leravina. Okay, his name is but the son of Bevimal. He says to Ravina, Hachi Kamar Mishmei Derava, Sarah Nami Lo Itzdrich Kra. Really, the Tzara didn't need a verse. Once the Erva is forbidden, it's obvious that Tzara is forbidden. Ki Itzdrich Kra. So why is there a verse about the Tzara? That was First, we neutralized and we said, well, the Joshua really isn't about the, 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 um, the Erva herself. Now we're saying it's not even about the Tzara. Well, what are you going to do with that whole drush? So they say, why do they mention the Tzara? Le Mishrei Tzara, Shalom Kol Mitzvah. The real Kiddush of the Pasuk, fascinating, is that the Isur that is obvious, that the Erva can't marry and the Tzara can't marry, is right, can't do Yibum, is only when there's Yibum. But if there isn't Yibum, the tzara is actually permitted. They're not linked forever, basically, okay? They're still linked when there's a mitzvah of yibum, and therefore one is going to exempt the other. But once the husband dies and there's no yibum issue, right, if he has children, then the whole drasha is coming to teach you, then the tzara can marry whoever she wants, even if they're related to the first wife. My time, how do we get this from the verse? Amar kra aleha. Now, remember what the aleha drasha was? Aleha is just like in Yivamayavo aleha. Also by the woman and her sister that you can't marry. Also by Yibum, it says Aleha. So Aleha comes to teach you, boom, come Aleha. When it's Yibum, that's when the Asira, when you can't marry a woman and her tsara. But the real Chiddush is Shalom, boom, come Aleha Sharia. If it doesn't, if it's not, boom, Yibum, then it's permitted. And then basically, according to this explanation, you really don't need it for the tsara either. You just need it to teach you that in a regular situation, not a Yibum situation, the tzara is actually permitted. Well, now Rami Barham is going to ask, and it's almost a ridiculous sounding question, but we'll talk about his logic as we go on. Rami erva gufa gufe. If you're going to say the whole thing is to teach the tzara when it's not a mitzvah of yibum is permitted, well, then let's, if we say that the tzara and the erva are the same thing, let's put that back on the erva and tell us, say what? Something that's absolutely ridiculous. But what he's kind of saying is with your logic, the tzara and erva are the same. So if we permit the tzara shalobim akom mitzvah in a regular case, we should permit the erva as well, meaning we should permit her to marry some forbidden relation, which is a little bit crazy. But I think what he's trying to do is kind of say there's, there's a problem with your logic. Ema erva gufe shalobim kol mitzvah tishtare. So according to what you're saying, you should permit erva shalobim kol mitzvah to marry her forbidden relative, which is a ridiculous thing to say. To which Rava says, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Kvilav kavachomer hu? Is it not an obvious kavachomer, logic reasoning? Bimkom mitzvah asira. If when there's a mitzvah of yibum upon you, you can't marry, let's say your father, if you fall to yibum to your father, so shalom kom mitzvah sharia, we're going to permit it all of a sudden when it's not a mitzvah? That's obviously ridiculous. So comes, and this is really Rami Bahama's reasoning, he says, well, According to that, then what you said before is ridiculous because the, the whole logic of the tzara is almost a crazy logic. We permit the tzara to marry my relative when it's just random and she wants to marry him, but we don't permit it when there's a mitzvah upon her. And that's, I think, what Rami Barham is really trying to get at is there's no logic to that whole thing that we just established. Now, it happens to be true. But what he's trying to say is if you're establishing a logical pattern here, then take that logic and apply it to the erva as well and say that the erva, if she can't marry Bama then of course, she, when there's Yibum, of course she can't marry. Of, you know, if she, um, again, if we're going to permit her, right, Shalom Komitzvah Tushtare, if we're going to permit her in a Yibum case, then we should permit her in another case. Now, that logic should go, right, this is a weird logic, is what he's saying. So Amar Lay, he says, no, why do we not permit? The, the woman. Um, can't marry not only Yibum, but also Shalobum Kol Mitzvah. 
Why is that? Because it says, anytime your sister's alive, you can't marry her husband, no matter what. Right, that bechayah comes to be all inclusive, and what he basically says is bechayah is not really a necessary word. We can use it to teach not only when there's ibum, also when there isn't ibum. Amrale comes Rambi Brachama and says, uh, "Right, one second. Um, sorry, uh, just missed something. Did I read this? Komis Vasira Amrale. Oh, I skipped a line. No, no, sorry." I just read it right. I, I had to read it like this. Sorry. Amarle, Alech Amar Kra, right? Rabbi was saying, for you, this is what the verse Bechaya is coming, right? That's a re- response to what you're saying. Hi, Bechaya, comes Rami Barham and he says, What are you talking about? Bechaya is not free to darshan, even when there's no yibum. No. Bechaya me baile lem ute la charmita. Bechaya is coming to teach you. Remember we said, the brother's wife is never permitted to, even when the brother dies, only when there's Yibun. But otherwise, you can't ever marry your brother's wife. But a man can marry a sister and a woman and her sister if the sisters, if his first wife is no longer alive. That's what you need Bechaya to teach you. After death, right? Meaning you can't learn from there what you're trying to learn, meaning I'm back to my question. So now they say, no. Ha-hi mi v'isha ala nafka. The fact that you can't marry her, if you, that while, once she dies, you can marry her sister, that you learn from the words, Isha lachota. Isha lachota means a woman and her sister at the same time, right? Or when they're still alive, when her sister is still around. El achota means while the sister's still around. You don't need the word bechayeha to teach it, okay? Bechayeha is free then, according to Rava. So it comes around, Rabbi Barchami says, no, that's not true. Imi Isha lachota. You would have thought when your sister is still married, when her, her sister is still married to you, you would have thought if you divorce her, right? Let's say you divorce one woman, then you can marry her sister. That's why you need to say, no, 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 you can't do that either. As long as the sis- your first wife is still alive, it doesn't matter if you're married or not, you can't marry her sister. So therefore, which basically means that Rami Barhamet ended with the last word in this argument. And he basically says to Rava, it doesn't make sense what you're saying that the whole drasha is there. You don't need a drasha for erva. It's all for the tzara. It's all to teach that the tzara is permitted. Shalobim kol mitzvah. To which he says, well, if you're going to permit the tzara, shalobim kol mitzvah, you should permit the erva, shalobim kol mitzvah. That's ridiculous, basically. And, that, and then any argument Rava tries to bring gets knocked out. So here comes an answer for Rav. Ella Amar Rav Huna Bartachli Kamish made the Rav Trey Kray Ktiv says there's two psukim. Ktiv Isha Lachot Aloti Kach Litzvo Uktiv Legalot Ervatah. It's not really two psukim; it's a part of the same pasuk. But you'll see something strange. Isha Lachot Aloti Kach Litzvo. There's two people here. Don't marry your wife's sister and her Sara, right? Her second wife. And then it says Legalot Ervatah, as if there's only one person that he's doing something wrong with here. So how do we resolve this? Two in the beginning of the verse, one in the end of the verse. So the answer is we're going to distinguish between yibum and not yibum, and that's going to prove Rava. Bimkom mitzvah, when there's yibum, shtehen asurot, the isha and her tzara. Shelo bimkom mitzvah, hi asura v'tzara tamutev. So he drops the whole thing of Bechaya, and he learns it from the fact that there's two and then one. It means there's one case where one of them is allowed, the other one isn't. That must be Shalom Komitsu will permit the tzara. We won't permit the woman to marry her brother, her wife's husband. Um, so then the Gemara says, for that logic, Ipochana, you could flip that. They were really giving Rava a hard time. Bim Komitzvah, he has surah v'tzara tamuteret. The Shalom Komitzvah shehan asurot. Why don't you say, Dafka, when there's a mitzvah, you should permit the tzara? Because again, Logic would always say, when there's a mitzvah, we want to override things and allow it to happen. So why don't you say, when there's a mitzvah, of course, you can't marry your father, but your second wife can. And when there's no mitzvah involved, maybe no one can marry your father. So im ken, lo yomar aleha. That's why you need aleha. Okay, the aleha comes to teach you. No, that's not the case. Aleha is b'makom yibum. And the Pasuk is talking about yibum. And in yibum, they're both forbidden. Okay, and that's the chiddush. So now we had a, a sixth explanation, which is really our third one that's going to stand, which is Rava says you don't really need a pasuk for the arayot. That's obvious. The whole chiddush in this pasuk is that the tzara can marry when it's not a time of evil. 
Still going to have a little bit more about this. Maybe Aleha is coming to say, Aleha, in Yibum, we're going to permit, actually. And this is what the Pasuk means to say. Again, we're just suggesting alternative drush When it's not Bimkom Yibum, neither of them can do it. When it says Aleha, at the end of the Pasuk, it's coming to distinguish. But if it's Aleha and Yibum, maybe they should both be permitted. What's the problem here? Well, either both are forbidden or both are permitted. Well, that doesn't fit with the two and one that we had before. So that's what they say. In Kem, the Galot Erva Dechada, which is singular, Hechi Mishkachala, Ibn Komitz Veshtehem Utarot, Ishalobim Komitz Veshtehem Asurot. You basically have a two and two, and we need a two and one because of the wording in the verse. So knocked out that question. Okay, we're going to end with this Gufa, Go back, going back to Rebbe. Rebbe had said, Right, that was less sort sarot varayot. He had a different way of learning this whole thing. Midit sarok tivach. So we're gonna have two questions. Number one, that first had nothing to do with the tzara. Where did you get to a tzara from here? He's talking about a man who's doing yibum. Veod sarot mi litzror nafka. And don't we have the other verse that says litzror teaches us sarot? So he says no litzror mapik lelechid rabbi shimon. We're not gonna get into this. We'll get to the sandap kavchet. He uses litzror for a different trasha for rabbi shimon. So therefore. Litzror goes out of the picture and we resolve question number two. But tzara, but where does it say tzara? So hachi kamer, he says, no, read it like this. In ken If you were talking just about the woman herself, just say v'lakach. U'lekacha sounds like two. Lakach and then ota, like as if there's two l'kichot. Kol hechad yikat What does it mean you can marry, you can't marry two people, but t'ibai nasifai, t'ibai nasifai. If there's two possibilities that are both permitted, then Sharia. Then you can marry either one of them. You can do Yibam with either one. Vilo, but if one of them you can't, that's exactly our case. She's Erva, you can't marry her. Travayu Asira, and then both are going to be forbidden. Vibma, what does he do with the word Vibma? Vimkom Yibum, who does Sirit Sarah? Shalom, Kom Yibum, Sharia Sarah. Again, he uses Vibma. If it's Yibum, we're going to permit, we're going to forbid this. But when it's not Yibum, that's exactly what Rava explained the other Trasha, right? Then you're going to allow. For Rabbanan, so now we're left with, well, the rabbis who learn all this from the other verse, what do they need this verse for? Lekacha means when you marry this Yevama, this is very interesting halacha, she becomes your wife for all intents and purposes. You might've thought, let's say you divorce her, maybe you can't marry her again, because in the end, Eshet Ach comes back, she's actually your brother's wife. But no, once you do Yibam, She's your wife, and the whole Eshet Ach disappears. So if you divorce her, you can remarry her. Assuming she doesn't marry anyone in between, we'll get back to that case in a bit. The Yibma, and you're not going to like this one, Al Korcha. Yibma means he does Yibum with her, even if she's not willing. Okay, with marriage, usually you have to be willing. Even if she doesn't want to, he can actually do it. Maybe we'll discuss this more at a different time. The Rebbe, now Rebbe, who doesn't have these words to Darshan like this, where does he learn the other things? And with that, we'll finish. It says, Lisha comes to teach you that she's his wife for all intents and purposes. And Al Korcha mi Yivama Yavo Aleha Nafka, because it says the Yivama, not because of the word Yivama, but because it says Yavo Aleha, he's the one who initiates. It sounds like he could do it even if she's an unwilling partner. And with that, we'll finish our daf and we'll get back to, to more of this tomorrow. Have a good day, everyone.